Let us do a quick recap of what happened in Job so far. We took a long break actually from um, last week, then we have Christmas, then we have New Year, then last week we went through Psalms. A lot of things had happened. I hope we have not forgotten Job. Okay, so what happened so far? <clears throat> we began, we know, for chapter 1 and 2. Chapter 3 was uh, Job's lament on his suffering, regarding his suffering. Then it follows by a series of talks, and we've, com we've just completed in our last sermon last year, end of last year, the first cycle of their conversation. So there was chapter 4 and 5, Eliphaz, um, the first speech. Today will be his second speech, telling Job that only sinners will suffer. Then chapter 8, uh, uh, Bill Deck's uh, speech basically is what uh, uh, Derek has summarized for us. He says, your family must have sinned terribly, you and your sons. In chapter 11, Jopha says, things could be worse for you. You must be thanking God already. Your children died. Your, your, all your cattle are gone. Your business are gone. Things could be worse for you. you know, that was chapter 11. And then the last uh, sermon was by uh, Deacon Derek that he says, the reply to these hurtful words, I have all these complaints and complained about, and then he ended up by complaining about God's silence towards him. You know, so this is all that was happening so far until chapter 14. Okay, and in between, uh, uh, the, the speeches were all uh, Job's reply to them. And uh, if you notice here, we will see this is the beginning of cycle number two, the second cycle. There are things, something changed. I put here the tones increase in, in their intensity, the angles increase, intensity of their speech all increase. But something else decreased when all these things increase. The sympathy towards Job actually decrease, decreases. And something else besides their sympathy decrease, there's something within, if you continue to read through Job, there are something else that decreases as well. And it's, this decrease is to Job's detriment, to his disadvantage. And if you no, notice in cycle one, Job prayed a lot. In chapter seven, half of the chapter was his prayer. Chapter 9, where end part was his prayer. Chapter 10, almost a whole chapter was his prayer. Chapter 13, one third of it was his prayer. Chapter 14, almost a whole chapter was his prayer. But now, if you take a look at this cycle, this is what has decreased. Job's prayer decreased in this cycle too. In the whole of chapter 15 to 21, the second cycle, he only prayed once at chapter 17. So you begin to see that this also begins a problem with Job. Okay, so let's pray as we look at the Job chapter 15. Father, we pray for your wisdom from above. We pray for your spirit to be working in our hearts, in our mind, to help us understand your word, and also in our hearts, not just help us not to just walk away with head knowledge, but may our hearts also be completed by your spirit through your word, Lord, that our lives will work out these convictions by the power of the Holy Spirit. So be with us this afternoon. Grant us energy, both physically and spiritually. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. This is a beginning of New Year. Almost beginning. The first year, the kids have their first uh, week of their our school. When kids grow one more year, in our young, when we were young, we would say, yes, one year older. But for some of us, after one year, we don't say yes anymore. What do we say? We lament. Ah, one more year older. Older. Yeah. In, the, in our society, there's always tension between the older people and the younger generation. And what we call this a uh, generation gap. And the younger people, what do they want? They want more freedom. They want more trust from the adults. Right. Now, what does older people want? Older people want respect and recognition, right? Yeah. Even in church, sometimes the younger people want change, uh, want things to be newer, want things to be better, newer songs, better program, and things like this. But what does older people want in church sometimes? Ah, I've been singing hymns all these years, so he must be good. Lah. Uh, so in both arguments, there are problems. Uh, so we are not citing any sides here. You know? So in our especially in our Asian society, elderly people actually claim a little bit more respect than compared to the Western world, right? Yeah, so 
<laughs> and um, one key reason that we show more respect to the elderly people is because of their grey hair. That's right, their grey hair. And uh, what's the symbol of grey hair? Most people say the symbol of grey hair is wisdom. Wisdom. Oh, there's this statement that says grey hair is the highlight of wisdom. You know, you highlight your hair, right? But people become grey. It's a highlight of wisdom. Uh, so even younger people today actually highlight their hair to this color, ash grey. I show you some pictures, huh? Ah, some Korean pop star. Don't ask me who they are. I also don't know who they are. <laughs> some Korean pop star, huh? So they color their hair ash grey. So people are like, wow, this is a very in thing. You know why? Because uh, uh, maybe this is a symbol of wisdom, like highlight of, they call this a highlight of wisdom. You know, when we were younger, once you see some white hair, we pluck, 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 we'll pluck out those white hair. Nowadays, they everything. Now you can even sit, buy a cream uh, that actually make your hair ash grey. Yeah, I saw in everything. So I didn't buy it. Like, I didn't buy it. Huh? I didn't buy it. Yeah. These are all the Korean star, Korean star. But don't think only the Korean star have uh, this ash grey hair. Huh? Singapore also have. Let me show you. Don't blink your eye. Huh? Woo! <laughs> wow, this is authentic one. Right? Oh. <laughs> what is Job 15 about? Well, in Job 15, Eliphaz actually played this card, the grey hair card, because to him, grey hair is a highlight of wisdom. Let's take a look at his argument. Huh? What does Eliphaz point out about? Verse 1 to verse 6, you take a look at your passage here. Eh? What is Job basically saying to, sorry, what's Eliphaz basically saying to Job? First, He's telling him, verse 1 to verse 6, Job, you talk too much. But that's not all. Your speech has no substance. If you take a look at verse 1 to verse 6, he, he kept on repeating and attacking Job's words, his speech, his answer, his arguments, his lips and his mouth. He kept on repeating this uh, concept to him, telling him, you're, basically telling him, you're, you're talking too much. And this is probably the reaction for Eliphaz towards Job of the three chapters, chapter 12 to 14 of uh, uh, Job's speech, right? He's basically telling uh, Deacon Derek, lah, hey, you preached too long already. Lah. Uh, no, 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 no. It's, not, it's not true, not true. Okay. It was a re probably also a reaction to chapter 6, verse 26, when Job says, a worse of a despair man belongs to the wind. And that's how today's chapter begins. He says, why are you using all so much wind in you, so much wind in east wind in your stomach? You know, so he's just saying that, why want so much wind in you? He's saying that you are talking too much and your speech are like the wind. Really, literally like the wind. He has no weight. Verse 3 says they are actually useless. Useless. Do we agree when people talk too much and their speech end up useless? Yes, actually we do. So many times people talk and talk and talk and talk right? and end up, they only prove that they are very unwise. Right? And actually Proverbs say that too. Proverbs 17 verse 28, I showed it in the IDG group. Let me read for you. It says, even a fool who keeps silent is considered wise. When he closes his sleep, he is deemed intelligent. This is what Proverbs 17 says. So, yeah, it's true that generally some people just nyang, 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 and you know, no much wisdom in them, lah, you know. But it may not also be true in this case because what was Job undergoing is totally different from another person. He undergo through such great suffering and he was at this point wrongly accused by his friend. So I put here that we must be careful and implication that to judge a person's moral or the wisdom by his speech may not be that straightforward. We, we have to take it into account the background that he's from. In this case, Job have gone through such tremendous struggle and suffering. You know, so it's, it's a different thing. So we cannot just um, be so simplistic in uh, judging a person's moral merely by his speech. Okay, so in this case, what Job says still stands. Words of a despair man belongs to the wind. And verse 7 to 9, what, what else was uh, Eliphaz saying? He says, you are not wiser than us, Job. He said, were you born before the creation? Do you have some special knowledge with God, some kind of conference with God that we do not have? You know, so it was probably a reaction to chapter 12, verse 3, and chapter 13, verse 2, when Job says, I'm not more inferior than you. So now Eliphaz says, neither am I more inferior than you. 
You know, and chapter 13, Job says, your silence is actually your wisdom. So now, I think at this point, you can feel that Eliphaz is a bit frustrated, even maybe that his pride is being hurt. So at this point, that's why he's turning back and says, Job, you are not even wiser than us. You know, that's what he's saying. Okay, and so it is not wise to argue when you, you feel that your pride is hurt. Okay, so I put here words from a hurt pride. Maybe prideful defensive, pridefully defensive yourself, or you be ugly offensive. Can you see? Because your your pride is hurt. Now you want just want to defend yourself, or at one you may step one forward, one to hurt the other person. So this is totally unwise. So this is the uh, counseling uh, knowledge zero one zero. Is this is a no 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 to someone who is counseling or comforting someone who, who is suffering so much? Okay, and verse ten to thirteen. What else is Eliphaz saying? He says, we are wiser, in fact. Look at our grey hair. We are wiser than you. And our advice is from God. And it doesn't do you any good if you, if you go against my advice or go against my, my words. It, it reject my, uh, my comfort to you. That's what he's saying here in verse 11. So the Chinese have one saying, which uh, in our IDG group, some of them actually mentioned this. It says something like this, Chinese thinking. Lah, huh? It said the amount of salt I've eaten is what? It's more than the amount of rice you have eaten for your whole entire life. But be careful, lah, baby. we may get kidney failure. Lah. Okay, but anyway, it's something like that. Lah, huh? It's something like that. Okay, so it's, it's like the, the, the length of bridges that I've crossed is longer than the, um, the length of the route you have traveled for your whole entire life. This is a Chinese saying. It's like, I have so much experience. I have so much experience than you. Look at my gray hair. It's more, I'm even older than your father. That's what it says here in verse 10. No, and if you reject my advice, Eliphaz is saying, you are rejecting God's comfort because my advice is God's words. Is God's comfort. Okay, so that's what he's saying here. So it's a very dangerous thing. So he thinks that he represents God in his words of wisdom. So the advice here, the implication here, I put, we must be very careful not to equate our advice as God's advice. Even we may mention God's name in our advice, we may even quote Bible verses in our advice. We must be very careful. Do remember that Satan can also quote the Bible and Satan does give advice in the name of God too. Remember in Genesis 3, remember the temptation of Jesus in uh, Matthew 4? All these are quoted. And at the end of Job chapter 42, verse 7, God actually told Eliphaz, you have not spoken rightly of me. And Job was, uh, Eliphaz was so confident that if you reject my advice, you're actually rejecting God. But at the end of it, God told him, you have not spoken rightly of me. And chapter 4, the 2 verse 8, God actually said, Eliphaz, all this that he has said is misrepresenting him. It is called foolishness, folly. Next, chapters, uh, verse 14 to 16, what was Eliphaz telling Job? He says, no one has no fault. La. You see, la, no one is perfect. One, and this is actually repeating himself in chapter 4, verse 17 to 21. You know, and he says that God even despised the angels, the heaven beings, and if the heavens are not holy enough for him, because God is above everything. So what do you think you are, Job? That's what he's saying. You know, who do you think you are but mortal men who constantly sin? You, you sin and like drinking water. Okay, so... Again, this is what we have said before, so I'm just going to go through quickly. He said, in this broken world, we must understand sometimes suffering may not, may not be a direct effect of our sin. Sometimes suffering in our life may not be a direct effect of our sin. This is a broken world. We must face this. You know, sometimes in our broken world, someone is against you or something go wrong in your life, someone falls sick in your family, it may not be because of you. You must understand that this is a broken world. Things have all gone wrong. Okay, so it may not be a direct effect of your personal sin. Lastly, verse 17 to verse 35, I'm just going to lump up this whole portion. What was Job telling? Sorry, what was Eliphaz telling Job? He says, Godless person, a godless person, a godless person will have bad ending here and now and soon. That's what he's saying. Godless person 
would have bad ending here and now and soon. Look at verse 21, he says, they will have no peace. Even in their peaceful time, peace, peaceful time verse 24, 21, 24 says, destroyer will come and attack them. They will have no hope. They only face with disaster. Verse 22 says, they will have no hope to turn or return from darkness. They will just go deeper into darkness. You know, they, they have, this is what they will be like. Their good time, their prosperity will end soon. Look at verse 29. He says, their wealth will not endure. Even the plant, the crops that they have will, will be destroyed as when they are shoots. As young as the shoot, they wouldn't have the chance to grow up. You see, verse 32 says, before their time comes, disaster will just attack them. Their palm branch will have no, no chance to turn green. Everything will be cut short. That's why he says, you, you have now, here and now, and soon. And verse 33 says, the unripe grapes will just drop off. So it will be soon. That's what his perspective is. He thinks that evil will have its consequences here, now, and very soon. True? Not very really true sometimes. Because why? Sin, we, something we agree with him, sin will have its consequence. Yes, we all agree. But God had his timing. It may not be here and now. We will talk about this a little bit more later. And, okay, so now that we understand what Eliphaz is saying to Job, we need to dig a little bit deeper into Eliphaz's thinking. We need to discover three things about Eliphaz. What is his key accusation of Job? What is his key assumption? And lastly, what is his key theology? Okay, what was Job's key uh, uh, accusation? It will be helpful if you look through this chapter and you begin to pick up the repetitions in this uh, chapter. Okay, and you look at verse 4. Is he accused Job's word causing people to turn away or doing away with the fear of God or hindering the meditation of God? Verse 11, he accused Job of rejecting God's advice, which is his advice. And verse 13, he says, you're actually turning against God. Your soul is turning against God. Verse 25, he's implying that Job is someone who actually raised his arm against God in defiance. You know? And verse 36, he says, you are like charging against the Almighty, your God, with your thick shield of your, all your arguments and your quarrels and your words. You are just charging against God with all this. And verse 34, he says, you are constantly in the presence, in the company of godless people. So basically, he's saying you are godless. That's what is a key accusation of Eliphaz to Job. Eliphaz thinks that the people that he is comforting, he's ministering to, has less regard for God than himself. So I put here, there's a danger, there's an implication for us to think about, there's a danger here, that we must be aware of the danger of ministering to people with this I'm holier than you attitude. So in giving advice, we must be very careful that we don't think that we are more spiritual. I mean, giving Bible study, you know, we always give Bible study to people and all this. And sometimes we think that because I give Bible study, I must be more spiritual. Is it true? Not necessarily. Uh, sometimes we are just more knowledgeable, but not more spiritual. And going for mission and all this, we minister to people there and people need, need us and all this. We feel that we are more spiritual, especially for maybe Singaporeans and all this. We must be careful. We may not be more spiritual. We are just richer. Physically, yeah. So we must be careful. Then the second thing we need to think about Eliphaz. What is his key assumption? What is his key assumption when he say all this? I put that in verse ten. His key assumption is this: age and experience means means wisdom. He says all oh, the grey hairs are here, older than your father. Is grey hair spoken well of in the Bible? Do we agree that age and experience means wisdom? I have now nobody there to answer. Yes, of course, I must say yes. I must say amen. <laughs> Proverbs 20 verse 29 says, The glory of young men is their strength. 
but the splendor of the old man is the gray hair. So in the pro, you know, context of Proverbs, the old man has his splendor, has his wisdom. So we must say amen. Ah. So is, is experience and age, mean, uh, does it mean wisdom for a person? Yes. But, but, that's not the whole answer lah, from the Bible. Look at another uh, wisdom book, Psalms 119, verse 99 to 100. Just I feel I didn't read the whole thing. Let me read it for you. So I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. Your word, your law is my meditation. I understand more than the aged, for I keep your laws, your precepts, your word, your scripture. I keep your testimonies. I keep your precepts. Well, teachers and the ages are not more advantaged in wisdom and understanding in this verse. So we ask ourselves, are the aged wise or otherwise? I put here, the aged is wise conditionally and unwise naturally. The aged, those who have grey hair, who have more experience in their life, may not need to be grey hair. I tell you, you may be a senior in your school. Uh, it, it's the same thing. Those who, are, who are, both who are more advanced in age, those who are older, we are only wise conditionally and unwise naturally. Let me explain with this diagram. This is an older man. I hope, I don't know older man or woman, I just... Take one picture lah, <laughs> with a wrinkled eyes, I must be older. older la. He's looking at his world. When he look at himself, I put that he's looking at actually God's image. When he look at the world, it's not his world, it's God's world. And you look at the church, it's not his church, it's God's church. So everybody look at all these things in our life with a certain lens. And if you look at God's image, own lens, He's looking at God's stuff from his own perspective. He's a fool. Can you see that? So, he may be very intelligent in his own field of study or work. He may even have earned a lot, earned a lot of money and climbing up in the career ladder, have a high status in the society. He may have a huge church ministry or mission. He may have all these things, but he will remain a fool in the eyes of God. Why? Because sin, when we look at the God's world, God's things, God's business, our own, God's image, ourselves, from our own perspective, our own perspective are already being crowded affected by sin because sin affects our judgment sin affects our value system so some people think ah bigger church means uh, more successful is it true we have to think through accurately is this my perspective or is it god's perspective uh, sin blinded us from spiritual truth so we cannot see god's world when we cannot see god's world from god's view we are actually foolish so I put that grey hair may not be highlight of wisdom, but actually accumulation of years of foolishness. I have a friend, semi-retired now, not from our church, very well to do, and uh, serve, used to serve in the church actively as an elder. But the sad thing is when I always hear about him, talk to him, or hear people's report about him, every ministry that he steps into, there will be fights. Every office that he goes to, the office will end up fighting him. The people in the office will end up fighting him. And he can't seem to see what's the problem. He can't. And I know him, so I think this is his problem. He always focused on external things, external appearances of things. He likes outward things to look good, he doesn't focus on the character. He likes things to be impressive to people. He doesn't focus on godliness. So, the, so it's very sad to see him move from job to job, from a ministry to ministry, and always end up fighting. Gray hair is, may not be a highlight of wisdom, but accumulation of follies. On the other hand, thankfully, this is, let me complete the picture. 
This is another old man. He look at himself, which is the image of God. He look at God's world, which is the world that he lives in, the environment that he lives in, and he look at the church, the businesses of God. He look at it from a different lens. He look at it from God's testimony, God's precept. He said, "I gain more wisdom than the teachers." David says, "Than the experts, those experts." And I gain more wisdom than the aged. Those who are experienced. Why? Because he's looking at God's world from God's lens, and he's called a wise man. So, H being experienced is only wise conditionally if and only if you have always been training yourself by. Putting on God's lenses from the Word of God, look at God's world, look at yourself, and look at the church, and not putting on the unwise worldview, the worldly worldview, your own personal worldview to judge all these things. So it's only conditionally wise, but naturally, by because of sin and effects of sin, we are naturally unwise, and we are just could be accumulating years of foolishness. Lastly, we come to the last part of Eliphaz and analysis of Eliphaz, his key theology. What is Eliphaz's key theology? I put there his key theology is T I P tip. What is T I P? It is a theology of immediate payback. God will repay evil and punish sin. Yes, yes. But his thinking is God will punish all evil and sin here and now and soon in our lifetime. So all those who suffer, you, Job included, must be because God is punishing you, because it's here and now and soon. So your wealth is cut off, your children's life is cut off. So you must be sinning against God. This this is theology, you know. So it's a theology of immediate retribution or immediate payback. Well. We agree to a certain extent. Sometimes it is true, but there are three things that dangerously have been left out in such theology. What are the three things? Number one, he has not considered eternity. God may punish sin now, but sometimes no. There's still this thing called final judgment and eternal damnation in hell. It's still true. And it still exists. Some people escape all these things here, and they face it thereafter. Okay, so there's this thing, this perspective of eternity. Second, they have not considered sovereignty. God can do otherwise. For example, He may choose to save the evil person and cancel his sin. Paul, for example, in the New Testament. He was such a murderous person, and he persecuted the church. And what happened? God changed his. God changed the whole situation. God saved him, and Paul, in the end, became. He, he did have to pay for whatever murderous sin that he had committed before that. But we'll talk about that a little bit more later. So this is a second perspective: sovereignty. Third, the grace of God. You have not considered the grace of God. In forgiving sinners through His own Son Jesus Christ, and when we do don't consider grace, you know what happened to us? I put here the danger is we will fall into this thing called self righteousness. Remember Jonah? We only remember his big fish lah. He was vomited up from a big fish lah. You know, but Jonah at the end of chapter four, when he saw the city of the evil city of Nineveh that he preached to. Waiting for them to be consumed by God's fire, nothing happened because God saved them. He was so angry. Why there was no immediate punishment for this evil nation? What was that? Self righteousness. When you, when he is more righteous than God, when the grace of God is not put into consideration, but the grace of God for sinners is this. While we were sinner, yes, we deserve God's wrath now, even, and we definitely deserve God's final judgment and eternal punishment in the hell. We all deserve that, yes. 
but the grace of God is this, that He punished our sin in His Son, Jesus Christ. And He exchanged our guilt and changed it to innocence at the final judgment day because of the death and resurrection of Jesus. This is made available for all sinners, actually, coming in humble repentance and faith in Jesus alone. So this theology of immediate payment is true sometimes or maybe a lot of times, but it's also dangerous when we apply it blindly, when we forget about God's timing in eternity, we forget about God's sovereignty, that He may change things around, and we forget about God's grace that we become more righteous than God. So let me summarize some um, Eliphaz thinking. His key accusation of Job is that <clears throat> Job must be a godless person. Anybody that he ministered to must be less godly than him. Second, his assumption that he's older, he's more experienced, so naturally he must be wiser, which is not true. And lastly, his theology of immediate payment. That he forgot about God's eternity, sovereignty, and grace. I'm going to end off with a reflection here, a reflection question. Do we sometimes also adopt Eliphaz's false assumption of ourselves that our age and our experiences naturally make us wiser? So how can, how can it be so? Well, it can be seen in the way we treat our juniors, how we talk down on them, how we sometimes bully them, right? This is dirty work that the juniors can do, or how we despise them. But it may not be just be looking down. It could also be looking up. It can also be seen that how we, en we are envious of those who are above us. One day I want to sit there, and I want to be in a senior position so that I will be looked up upon and can look down on all the juniors. It could be how we look at below and how we look at above as well. And this can be seen at home. It can be skin, seen in school, at workplace, and in church. Let's think about this. Pray to God, and after that, I'll close in prayer. Let's pray. Oh God, you are so gracious to us in our folly. And many times we are more foolish than we love to admit. But you are still so gracious to us. We thank you for Jesus. Even on the cross, he dies for our foolishness. But we thank you for Jesus too, because in Jesus, who is the wisdom of God, you have given us your spirit and your word to guide us in your wisdom. Thank you. We pray that God, we will continue to grow in wisdom and not to accumulate foolishness through the rest of our life. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.